from me now. I'll pass you over to Toby and I really hope that you enjoy your tasting. Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to this um, webinar with, with uh, Cristobal Undaraga of Coile. Um, I'm really uh, a great fan of what Cristobal is doing. Um, he's one of the few people who lives as much as he can um, on the vineyard. And um, I noticed the first time I met him, his card said viticultor, not winemaker. And he likes to live on the farm. And I think in Chile, where you have very some very, very large properties of two or 3,000 hectares, it's very difficult to get the real fine tuning of the two or 3% that makes a difference between good and great wines. Coile is a smaller property, it's more like 90, 100 hectares. And I think what's fascinating is um, uh, Cristobal's attention to detail uh, in the vineyard and the winemaking. Um, and uh, I think it's gonna be a fascinating evening to hear more about uh, how he practices his viticulture. So the plan is that I'll hand over very soon to Cristobal who will give uh, a brief talk with some slides. We'll then have a slight conversation with him and I. We'll taste some wines and then we'll have some questions. So, Cristobal, over to you. Hello, Toby. Hi. So it's a great pleasure, you know, to be and to share here today, uh, talking about uh, the wines, uh, the, our work in the vineyard, and also all this year that uh, I think since we met almost 10 years ago uh, and to to be able to share our vision you know in the winemaking and the and the viticulture as you say Toby for me uh, since the beginning you know the the idea of making wines uh, was always very much uh, focused on the expression of the place so that push us, you know, with my family in 2008 to start working our whole property on, on biodynamic, uh, under the biodynamic management, you know. For me, it was the key to, first of all, push all the team and go forward to, to, to really take out all of the inputs in the place. I, when I talk about inputs, I, I talk about all the, the inputs from the state, starting from the, of course, the chemical inputs, you know, all the chemical fertilization, all the herbicides, uh, all the insecticide or, or, or fungicide. So I always say all the things who kill the, the expression of the place, you know. I, for me, that was a key factor. Uh, also, just playing, taking out the chemical fertilization will push the vines to, to don't be lazy, as I always say, you know, <laughs> vines will have to go deep in the soil. So they, vines are, uh, they have in his own uh, identity, that ability to search deep in the soils, you know, so whatever, if you have a more clay so, or, or more rocky soil in the upper uh, of the, our property, you know, that was the, the first step, you know, uh, in those years in 2008, who uh, challenged us, you know, to go uh, in this work. I will present, Toby, a few slides uh, that uh, will help to introduce Coile, uh, Coile wines. So here we are. I think this will help a little bit. You know, I always love pictures, you know, who help uh, to explain. So what is coile? Coile is this beautiful purple flower who grew up in, in our state. So this flower was for us, you know, an, an inspiration when we was looking for the name. Uh, in 2008, when we started this, this winery with my family, uh, we was looking for a name and we found this beautiful flower up in the mountains where we are and we took the name from that flower. 
So just a brief story, you know, in this picture, you can see uh, my grandfather, my great-grandfather and my grand-grandfather, Francisco, who started with Undurraga Winery in 1885. I'm part of the fifth generation in this work of the winemaking, you know. Um, we feel very proud, you know, to, to keep pushing this tradition in the market today with my family, my father, my, um, my sister and brothers. We are all, you know, working on uh, trying to express the, the identity of this beautiful place, this vineyard, you know. This is our Los Linges biodynamic vineyard. So today, three from the four wines that we will try are coming from this beautiful vineyard. Uh, this vineyard we planted on 2006, so it's just 14 years old vineyard. I think Toby uh, was first time here in this vineyard in 2011, so already nine years ago. And we've been developing the different places of this vineyard uh, since the base part, so the lower part of these uh, mountains, uh, give us, you know, from the wines that we will taste today uh, is the Carmener single vineyard came from the first terraces, these red ones, and in the right, in the, in, in the bottom right is the other block of Carmener where this Carmener came. And we also uh, pick from this estate the Tempranillo El Peuco, of course the, the cepage that we use for blending here, and also the Garnacha, the one that we will taste at the end, the Garnacha Cerro Basalto. Cerro Basalto is the upper part of the property, up in here, where I remark. And it's from there where we have some Mediterranean cepage and also some Bordeaux cepage like Carmener and Cabernet Franc. So our property, you know, uh, we try to build an environment where we can express the, the, the sense of the place. The architecture of the place is worked with rocks coming from the same state. We built one of the, for me, the key thing was to build not just a uni varietal or uni plant property. For us, all these corridors that you see here, that is our creek who came down from the mountains, you know. So this we call the biological corridors. So it's where the birds, uh, different animals, uh, insects uh, uh, from the place can, uh, can be there and can, uh, can uh, develop, you know, the sense of the place, the, the, for me, the, the, all the potential and the, the uniqueness finally from this place, you know. We also work, part of the energy that we use came from uh, solar energy. We are introducing as much as we can all sustainable concepts coming from the energy and also, of course, the, the economic and all the uh, human part that for me is one of the three main pillars of the concept of the place, you know. So weather, soil, and the human part. I'm deeply believe in that part, you know, where the humans, you know, are part of the sense and give the, that, that push to the good flow of this uh, project. Animals for us, of course, are part of the team. So sheep who help us in the control of the grass, the geese that we love, see that lovely picture there, they, they always support to taking some insects around, you know, and also they cutting a lot of grass, you know, in the vineyard. Chickens are giving us lovely uh, eggs from the place, you know. They, they always, uh, they also help us, you know, to control insects in different places where we move it, moving from all around the different blocks. The, the honey uh, hives, you know, the, the, the honey uh, insect, you know, I, I don't remember the name exactly, 
uh, but we produce honey and the bees. The honey. Yeah. Huh? Bees. Bees. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> yeah, I, I reckon that we took those pictures with Toby, this picture with Toby a couple of years ago. So the bees uh, help us, you know, to control botrytis in, in, in the time just before uh, picking the grapes. Of course, one of the key things in the soil uh, in, in the soil work is the compost. So for me, compost, the compost is the way that we fertilize, we fertilize, fertilize the soil. After every harvest, we put all this compost, we, the compost that we produce inside, inside each block. So you can see this autumn picture here where we already distribute the compost and we give to the soil after each harvest, the food for the soil who will bring life, who will uh, keep all the microbiology of the soil. And of course, finally, healthy soils means healthy vines. For me, that healthy vines will mean imbalance from all the aspects that we're looking in the wine. So balance in, in concentration, in flavors, in tannins, in, in all the, the things that we're looking for, the correct expression of the vine. For us, all the work in, in the environment, you know, are, are important. This is a picture that taken a few years ago, but it's uh, the same view that we have today here in the vineyard, you know. So all the flowers are coming up in the springtime. Uh, the work, as I say, you know, in the beginning that we make with our team after every vintage, you know, in, the, in these pictures here, we are filling horns with manure, making our 500 uh, preparation, biodynamic preparation. This is a party. This is a party where uh, the whole team, you know, participate once a year in the elaboration, the uh, making up of this uh, preparation is a part of the work, is a part, uh, as I say, a party where we all make it this, to give it to the land after one year as a biodynamic preparation. So that picture was a couple of years ago with the team after the, the harvest. And all this work, I always say, is for this, is to obtain the best and the more healthy grapes. This what inspire me, you know, to, to work with this philosophy, to make, you know, quality grapes. Of course, all of the grapes are hand uh, picked. We pick in, in boxes and that, you know, push us uh, to this. If you want, Toby, we can start with the tasting, uh, with the first wine or because I can explain a little bit with this picture here to the, our friends, you know, how we divide the, the state. But first of all, uh, we will start with the Pinot Noir, Toby. Yeah, that's great. Let's start with the Pinot Noir. And then I think it'd be very interesting, as you say, to explain with the other wines uh, where they come from and the different terraces that you have. Lovely. Lovely. So let's let's go for the for the Pinot Noir. I will I will leave I will leave that picture, Toby, uh, in the in the presentation. Or maybe we can talk a little bit uh, about the Pinot Noir, and after we retake the the presentation. Yeah, I think maybe to talk a little bit about some. Um... The Coile Costa, because this comes from the coastal vineyards, so it doesn't come from this one here, does it? It comes from land that you that you rent near the coast. Absolutely, absolutely. So, we, let's talk about roughly about this. You know, uh, I have actually a lovely picture here, but so the the Costa Vineyard, you know, is a is a vineyard that is located in the same, in, in the same uh, Colchagua Valley. And uh, I, I will 
could upload this picture of the vineyard. So we can talk with that picture in the back. Yeah. Because this is a very, this is very close to the coast, isn't it? How, how far from the coast is it? It's just uh, nine kilometers from the coast, Toby. Yeah. So this is a completely different matrix of soil. So in the coast in Chile, we have a, where we are in Los Linges, in the east part of Chile, the, the, the property that we was talking at the beginning is all in the Andes mountains hills. This vineyard here that we saw in the picture is in the coastal range mountains. So here, something very interesting is immediately you can see the, the hills are pretty much rounded. Huh? And that means that's older soils. The, 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 the wind coming from the sea, a craft, craft ship, you know, a, give form for these hills, giving this roundness. And the soil here in this property are a granitic soil. So we have granite, we have hints of uh, salts, you know, like some calcarium soils, just a little bit. And we also have all the influence coming from the sea breeze. Yeah, this is a, this is a considerably cooler property, isn't it? Because you're nine kilometers from the sea. The sea in Chile is very cold. You have the Humboldt current coming up from Antarctica. So um, <clears throat> swimming in the sea is a bit like swimming in the sea in Scotland. It's like 12 or 13 degrees. It's very cold. Most people are swimming in wetsuits. Um, so the, you know, what happens is the, the, um, the, the, land, the land warms up, the hot air rises, and it draws the, it draws the cool air from the coast, particularly in the afternoons, doesn't it? Yeah, I, al I always say, Toby, the, the ocean is giving us like a, a kind of air condition effect. So the wind coming from the sea pass over the sea, and that wind who came to the land, you can see that picture with a sunny day, but maybe inland could be 30, 32 degrees Celsius, but in the coast, the same day is in between 20 to 24 Celsius. So I always say in the, in the coastal property, we have more or less 10 degrees less temperature in summertime in average. So that keep the freshness of the aromas, that keep the, the sugar levels lower, and that keep the, the, the level, the natural acidity levels higher. And that give for the Pinot Noir in this case, that balance and expression that we can see here coming from this Pinot Noir 2017 vintage that I don't know if you remember 17, Toby, but it was a warm year in, a, in Chile, it was a warm vintage. One of those vintages who was, uh, I think 17, and 19 maybe are one of the warmest in the last uh, years in, a, in the coast in Chile. So that give the whole ripeness that we have here. But I always take the, the, the word talking about the importance to pick the grapes at the correct time. The, the, the good reading of each harvest that we are doing. And we discuss a lot with Toby about that issue that are becoming a, a big issue in Chile with the global warming effects. You know, we, we've been uh, suffering about the dryness in the winter time, uh, the, the warmest day in summertime, even the coast, you know, some days rise the 30 degrees that, that was not usual in that, in that area. So that will give us, you know, ripe conditions in the 2017 compared, for example, with the 16, on almost, 30 days before that, that was 16, that was a cool year, we pick it uh, 30 days before and 17. Yeah, it's a, it's a big difference. However, I, I really like this Pinot Noir. It, it, it's, it's quite meaty and rich and beetrooty and earthy. It's, it's less of a cool climate sort of black cherry fruit. It's more meaty and rich. Um, it's very velvety and in the mid palate, but then there is 
but I think a very nice freshness at the end. So I think it's it's a very good result for a warm year, in my view. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy, Toby, this year when we when we saw that condition in the in the grapes, you know, on the and the condition of the year, we decided to make the the fermentation with a 50% full uh, clusters. Yeah. So that permit us, you know, to, to give a, a, an extra effect of carbonic maceration over the grapes in the maceration. And that helped to, to keep the freshness. That, that helped to, to keep, you know, the, the, the crunchy uh, flavor and feeling of the Pinot Noir. Of course, we 100% did a pillage I remember that that fermentation on 17 was so quick. It take us, you know, between seven to nine days to finish the fermentation. And we escape immediately to the concrete eggs or to the barrels. So this, this Pinot Noir is fermenting, it's a aging half in concrete eggs and half in, a, in burgundy barrels. You can see in this picture, Toby. I don't know if you see the harrow in the in the screen. Yeah. But it, that that here is the south face of the Pinot Noir. Just in the other side of that hill is the north face of the Pinot Noir. So here we make two different harvests. First of all, north facing. In the southern hemisphere, north facing will mean warmer. And after we go with the south facing. So sometimes could have a, between five to seven days of different in the harvest. So north facing is ripe earlier, south facing is ripe later. North facing will age in, in burgundy barrels. So the, the, the more, as you say, the more meaty, the more uh, ripe uh, uh, face of this Pinot Noir are coming from the uh, north facing. And the south facing are always more landy, more mushroom notes, some some notes, of, some herbal notes that you can find as well in there, or the or, or the orange peel notes that you find in this Pinot Noir are coming from the south facing that will age in concrete eggs. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I think time is running on, so maybe uh, yeah. we should we should. <laughs> It's so interesting to hear you talk, but we, I think we must keep moving. Um, so I think maybe let's, we should, can you talk a little bit about the, the Carmenere? Yes, so let's jump to the, this picture, Toby. So I will roughly introduce the Los Linges uh, concept of soil that we have. So in this picture, you can see the whole vineyard. So in, that, in those white lines that appear there, in the bo bottom part of the property, we have all almost 20 hectares of the first terrace. The first terrace of the property in Los Linges mean more or less a 20% of clay, little size basaltic rocks. So I always say it's kind of a tennis ball, you know, if we compare with the, the, the average size. And it's where the Carmener single vineyard will came. In the second terrace, so in between the two lanes, we are going up. So we're going more or less almost 80 meters more in terms of altitude. We are closer to the mountains. So clay is going lower to 10, 15% of clay and the size of the rocks are bigger. So here the, the average size of the rocks, the basaltic rocks are kind of a, a soccer ball, football uh, ball. And after in the upper part of the property, so from this line, all the upper blocks, you know, are located over a, a bedrock. So the upper part will have less clay and we will have a profile of soil between 10 to 40 centimeters of clay with rocks. But under that is a full basaltic bedrock where the vines can hit the rock. But the, the basaltic uh, rock that we have here is easily cracked. I, I will show you after a, a picture of the, of, of the rocks. It's very friable, and, isn't it? This it is. Your basalt, yeah. It's very decomposed. And the roots can very easily go down 
um, three meters and find moistures and minerals in the fissures in in the rock. So it's very it's it's very um, easy for the vine to penetrate the decomposed schist, isn't it? Absolutely, it's it's one of the things that we develop, uh, Toby, and we we we've been learning about the place. It's one of the fantastic things for me. Uh, I live actually down here, you know. <laughs> we, we've been a couple of times with Toby there. Uh, <laughs> every year, you know, visiting and walking all the vineyard around. And the, 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 the experience to under, understand the soils, you know, since we start working on 2008, first of all, with the, the a doctor in terroir, Pedro Parra, who is a friend of us, who helping who help us to understand the, 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 the matrix of soil that we have. And after, in to, from 2012 up to 2015, working with Claude and Lydia Bourguignon, they came from Burgundy. Uh, Claude is geologist. Lydia, she's a winemaker, they're a couple. And they help us also to describe the different kind of soil that we have, comparing with the taste of the wines. So it was always a, 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 a job that we did with Toby. Every visit yearly, we, we, we sit a day, day and a half, almost a full day, uh, Toby, tasting the different wines from different terrasses and trying to describe the different you know, blocks, how the expression of the Carmener will be in the first terrace, in the second, in the third. And that, in that way, create wines with even a micro sense of place. So that's... And generally, you, you were talking about the percentage of clay, because um, it's clay over, over basalt rock. Um, is it sort of generally true that at the bottom, you, where you have more clay, you have more vigor, you have more production? So it tends to be the wines of higher production. And as you go up, the soil gets poorer, um, there's less sort of vigor. So you, you, you get less crop, but more concentration. Is that roughly how it works? Absolutely, Toby. So finally, in the first terrace, because the, the uh, more deeper soils in terms of clay, will, first of all, we plant less density in the first terrace. So in the first terrace, we we have a, an average of 5,000 vines per hectare. In the second terrace, we have an average of 7,000 vines per hectare. And in the third terrace, we're going from 8,000 to 12,000 vines per hectare, depending the block. But as you yeah. say, in terms of, in, in the way that the soil is going more rocky, going to the upper parts of the property, the natural yield per vine is lower. So we're talking, in, in an average in the first terrace, we produce a kilo and a half to two kilos per vine. In the second terrace, we produce an average of a kilo per vine. And in the third terrace, we're going lower than a kilo. Sometimes, if we're talking about, for example, the Cerro Basalto Quartel G2, there is a blend of Carmener and Cabernet Franc. That Carmener produced never more than half a kilo per vine as a natural yield, you know. So that, that finally, you know, in the same property give us an, a lovely spectrum of uh, expression of the grapes, you know, under the same weather, but different type of soils, you know, of course, under the same uh, flow and love from the team, you know, will give us finally the expression for these wines. Yes, and each of your blocks also is, um, has different irrigation uh, pipes with different amounts of water, doesn't it? So you can, you, you're divided into how many different blocks in the property, roughly? We, we have, uh, from uh, uh, harvest blocks, we have 87 units of harvest. Yeah, blocks that's amazing. Of, and that's, that's over, what, about 100 hectares now? We, we have om, almost 80 hectares, a little bit less than 80 hectares. So it's, uh, we have blocks from 0.1 hectare, Toby, and the biggest one are 2.5 hectares. So we, and we harvest all this separate. 
they can go to ferment in, a, in half a ton a barrique, going to open tanks to, for pillage or for three tons, five tons, 10 tons tanks. So we divide everything, you know. We've been doing the same from 2010. So after 10 years, we, we're still learning. That is the lovely thing so about uh, enology and viticulture that you never stop learning and you never stop challenging, you know. No, and, always... and as you said, you have, um, you, you have small fermentation vats because one of the things that you often go see in a winery designed by an architect is that all the tanks are the same size. Yeah. Yours, you have, yours, you have different sizes and this ability to keep things separate means you learn a lot about each block, don't you? And you keep the elements separate and the best ones go into the best, the best quality uh, wines and the others go into the lesser quality ones. So this way you're able to divide and get a lovely range of qualities. I, What's that? I think, Toby, you know, one of, one of the key uh, develop of our project, you know, was to put, first of all, all the effort over the, the plantation of the vineyard and, and the way to understand the vineyard. As you know, you know, we rent facilities, we rent winery. So when, when we have our rented winery very close to Los Lingos Estate, but we bought since the beginning tanks in the way of we need. So as you say, we was not designed by architect that, okay, let's buy uh, 20 tanks of 10 tons and 55 of uh, five tons, no. We, we went buying, you know, barrels, barrels food dress, concrete eggs, or stainless steel tank in the way to fit with the size of each block. So finally, what we have today, as we saw in many trips, you know, I don't know, in the round, I, I still remember that lovely trip that we did uh, from, from Cot Roti down to Bandol seeing many, many iconic uh, winemakers, you know, and for me, the, that, that vision that you build your winery feeding with your blocks, finally, you know, that for me is a key thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the worst places are those that put everything into the same pot, you mix, you mix different qualities. I think we should, we should carry on because I think, um, um, we should have about five minutes left to taste two wines to allow okay. a little, to allow a little so, time for questions. So, so just, tell us a little just, bit about the the Carmenere and then the Garnacha. Roughly on the Carmenere, uh, we make I think this first vintage of the Carmenere Toy on 2012 or 13 is coming from two blocks B B3 and D2. Uh, and it's a, it's a Carmener who really talk about place in terms of a play. One of the key things for me in the Carmener is when we talk out the chemical fertilization that, that was in 2008, after a couple of years, we saw that the pyracinic and the green aromas of the, uh, our Carmener dis start disappearing. Today, so we're talking from 2015 till today, we start picking early and early our Carmenere. Why we pick an early? Because the, the ripeness, the phenolic ripeness and the, the technical ripeness that we was looking came early with a lower sugar level, with a lovely acidity, natural acidity, and with just nothing of green aromas, you know? So of course we have the spiciness in the Carmenere, but we, we have a lovely smooth and concentration in this Carmenere. I don't know what you think, Toby. No, I like it very much. I mean, I think there are lots of different Carmenaires in Chile. And as Chris Ball was saying, they're learning how to make it. And in the early days, people thought that Carmenere um, was Merlot. It was confused with Merlot. So it was picked very early um, and then was green. Um, and then when people realized it's not Merlot, it's Carmenere, it was picked very late and then it got very jammy. Um, and in fact, I think what, what's great now is people are picking it ripe, but not too ripe. So I think 
it very quickly becomes very jammy carbonara and quite difficult to drink. So um, I like Cristobal's carbonara because it's in a relatively cool spot for carbonara. It's in Colchagua Valley. Um, but as you go down into the center where a palter is, it's really very, very warm. Cristobal's vineyards are between roughly 400 and 550 meters. And so it ripens, but it's still very drinkable. And I think that, that that's the key to your wine is it isn't a great big fruit bomb of jammy fruit. It's got, as you say, aromas of spice, cloves, and a lovely freshness. And for me, it's very drinkable. And many carmonaires can be too rich for their own good, in my view. Yeah, definitely. Definitely that way. So carmonair many times go overripe or over green. I think uh, it's a big challenge looking from the viticulture part, you know, to have the balance on, on over the grapes, to don't go too late and that early picking, keep the freshness and keep a balance in terms of aroma. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great what you've done is, is the replacing the fertilizer, the, the chemical fertilization with the compost. The, the fruit is ripening earlier, isn't it? And you can yeah. pick it at 13, 13 and a half degrees and it's ripe. Whereas before it was being, you had to wait until it was almost 14 and a half, 15 and yeah. you lost the freshness. So your ability to uh, encourage the ripeness to, to, to occur earlier means you pick it and it's fresher and in my view, better balanced. I think in that way, Toby, just to finish the Carmenere, you know, for me, just to understand the hanging period of the grapes from Berrason at the, uh, until the, the, we pick the grapes. Normally, Berrason of the Carmenere will happen in our property 1st of February. So if, if we put 1st of February and normally picking 10 years ago of Carmenere, middle of May, that means February, March, April, and some days of, uh, of May. So over almost 100 days of hanging period after Bursa. What we are doing now, so even to 2020 last vintage that we pick first days of March. So we have just 40 days of hanging period from variation to, to the picking. That means less sugar, that means better natural acidity, and finally, all, all the, the, the sense of the variety. I always say you obtain more sense of place with an early harvest. Of course, always talking about ripeness. Yeah, that's great. Now, I think it's lovely. It's a, as I said, it's a really drinkable wine. And um, a lot of our members are concerned with wines that are very, very high in alcohol. So. To have a Carmen air at 13, 13 and a half degrees is, uh, is great news. Right, let's, let's move on to the Garnacha and then we'll, we'll allow some questions. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, Tell us a bit we... about the Garnacha. Yeah, uh, I'm very proud, you know, to, to show you this first vintage of this bottling, Cerro Basalto Garnacha. We keep the Garnacha name in the label as uh, in the Basque origin my family is coming from the Basque country so we we take it the idea to keep that a sense of Basque origin the garnacha for me i always describe as uh, the pinot noir from the mediterranean weathers so keep that lovely freshness you know that lovely elegance and more fragile expression than could other mediterranean sepash could give us like Mubedre or like Carignan or Syrah. So we age this Garnacha half in concrete eggs. So like you see here and half in uh, burgundy barrels. In this case, you can see a Garnacha who is still a little bit close in the aroma, but it's a, we, we keep that close aroma because I think Garnacha is a very fragile fragile cepage in terms of going very easy in, in, in a more oxidative note. So we want to keep that reduction in the glass, in the bottle, and after in the glass, you can open up and start 
and joined us for me. Strawberry notes, Toby is always here in my in my mind. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting what you say because I think it's right. I think Garnacha, when it's young, has beautiful floral, rose petal aromas, strawberry fruit. It's very aromatic in its youth. Um, and as you say, it has a lovely silkiness, um, lovely texture, which is almost burgundian on the palate. Um, and yet it ages too. It'll develop noses of orange peel and so forth as it gets, gets older. And I think, um, as you say, it has a reputation for, um, for oxidizing. So you've been careful to keep this freshness. And I think this wine is a little bit closed when it was first opened, a little bit reduced almost. So I think if you're drinking it now, uh, try and decant it and serve it probably at 18 degrees. Um, but I think in a year or so, this wine is really going to blossom and uh, develop even further. Um, so I think um, lovely wines. Um, and thank you for your explanation, which I think was great. I'm probably now going to hand over to Emma to ask if um, you have any questions. Great, great, Tori. Yep. Of course. Okay, so firstly, if we can um, just, if you don't mind, Toby, explaining very quickly a little bit about the backing our best growers, um, which is the kind of theme behind tonight's tasting. Um, why did you choose Christabel's wines particularly? Well, um, I think Cristobal is one of our best growers because I think he's making amazing wines and he's doing so on quite a small scale. Um, and that's quite difficult to manage um, because it takes a lot more money. Um, and some of Cristobal's markets, I know he told me that in China uh, were, were much, much lower. And also a lot of his distribution in Chile was in the restaurant business. And that just sort of disappeared like it did in England. So um, we, I wanted to help Cristobal um, by putting his wines in this offer. Uh, and hopefully people have uh, uh, bought the wines and enjoyed them. I mean, there isn't a discount because <laughs> Cristobal can't offer a discount. Um, but the idea was to put them in another offer to get more exposure and to help Cristobal by selling more of his wines than if it hadn't gone in this offer. So that was the idea behind it. That's perfect. Thank you very much. It helps to put the tasting into context as well. So thanks, Toby. Um, we now have a question from Beverly about Pinot Noir. Beverly, are you there? Yes, I am. Good evening, Cristobal and Toby. And thank you, Cristobal, for your wonderful presentation and, and uh, the photographs. It has transported us. Um, I'm very tempted by the Pinot Noir. Given what you said about the different wines from either the north or south facing slopes and the particular 2017 vintage, how would you compare your Pinot Noir with a Burgundy wine? So it's always a, a big question to compare uh, the wines with wines from other spots, you know, but uh, I always say, you know, uh, first of all, you know, the, the importance from the south and, and north facing is the ability to detect in the, in the place uh, the, the different uh, way that the, the, the place is talking to you. So in the way that the, the, these, these uh, parcels of uh, Pinot Noir that we have here, we, we pick it in different two different uh, blocks, north facing and south facing. And that permit us, you know, to make a more fine work in terms of extraction, in terms of aging, and finally, uh, a more unique expression of the place. And when we're talking about comparison with other regions, you know, as Burgundy could, see, could uh, be, we know that Burgundy is a path of different colors, you know, so going from all the Codoc, you know, you will have thousands of lovely growers there. So it's, I, I, I always say it's difficult to compare. But if we talk about our property, where we have clay in the first 30 to 60 centimeters, and under that we have a granitic soils, we, we should have a Pinot Noir 
as we talk, uh, as we can taste here, with a lovely uh, uh, back bones, you know, good structure. And in that way, I will pass the ball to Togi, who is the expert in Burgundy. And I will ask you, Togi, from which, uh, which Burgundy region or, or, or area you, you will compare uh, closely our Pinot Noir? I think they're different animals. I think um, I think what New World Pinots have is the lovely succulence and richness to them, uh, which you get relatively early on. Um, and this is sort of rich and meaty, and yet it has a lovely freshness. I think um, it's also quite sort of soft and generous. I think in Burgundy, um, the wines have a different texture. They have relatively firmer tannins and higher acidity. Um, so you get something that's more structured. Um, and I think um, the great wines have a wonderful texture with very old vines and so forth. Um, and they need to be kept longer. So I would, I would say that they're, they're texturally different and they're, they're a little bit firmer and they're a little bit um, more acid. Um, and they need more time to come round. This wine, you know, 2007, it's already, 2017, it's already delicious. Um, in Burgundy, you know, you'd have to wait probably 10 years for, well, seven or eight years for a village wine, 10 to 12 years for, for a uh, Premier Cru. And then you get all the nuances that you get with, with the extra bottle age. So I think Burgundy in the end is a little bit more complex, but you have to wait and you have to pay a lot more. So I think for bang for your buck, this is as good as it gets. <laughs> Thank you, Dolly. Absolutely perfect. So the next question we have from Hannah. Now, Hannah had a couple of questions, but Hannah, we're going to get you to ask your question about Carmen Air because um, your other question about eggs, we're going to, there's quite a few of them, so we're going to put them all together. Anna, are you there? Hi there, yes, I am, oh, sorry. Perfect. <laughs> I'm getting lost, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I was just wondering, how is Carmenere viewed on the domestic market today um, in Chile compared with Cabernet Sauvignon? Because I think it has such high potential and it's really viewed quite highly now, particularly in the UK. But, people know about it, but I just wondered how it was viewed locally. Yeah, so I think, thank, thanks for the question, Anna. Uh, I, I think, you know, Carmener is a, is a cepage that definitely developed well in the last uh, 10 years in Chile. Just to remember that Carmener was rediscovered in Chile, as Toby said in the beginning, was confused with the Merlot. But I think in the last 10 years, Carmener been uh, doing a, a more fine job over the viticulture, over the winemaking. And it's uh, developing a, a very interesting uh, uh, consumer uh, knowledge about the Sebastian. So even if we can say that Carmener from the north, uh, from Maipo or from the uh, Pelmo or from Los Linges or even from other spots, uh, re remarkable spots as could be Apalta. Uh, Carmener been doing a path where the, the, the consumers been learning, winemakers been learning, and also, you know, the whole concept of Carmener is just for me building up, still young and uh, we're still learning about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the potential for Carmenere, I've tasted a few older ones uh, made, made by De Martino in the 80s, uh, where they were picked much, um, they were picked about 12 or 13 degrees, which is much more the way that Cristobal is now making them. And with 10 or 15 years in bottle, they really became something like uh, a Santamillon, in a sense that, you know, Carmenere is sort of supercharged uh, Merlot, so it's rich and plummy, but it can have a cedary top note, 
And I think um, the, the wines, as Christabel was saying now, are being picked a little bit fresher um, with better acidity. And I think that's the potential of where they're going from this sort of big fruit bomb to a much more aromatic, fresher wine that will develop very nicely in the bottle. So I think um, all these changes uh, are, are such that the, the idea of carbon air is just now beginning to, people are uh, um, trying to, to find out what they think the potential is. But in my view, I think um, a sort of Santa on like flavor, uh, where you have plummy ripe fruits, but a cedary top note um, is the potential of carbon air. And I think it's, it can be very interesting. Thank you, Dory. Excellent. Now, ever since you mentioned um, concrete eggs, um, as they say, the phone lines have lit up. Um, there's been quite a few questions that have come in about them, of one of which was Hannah sends me saying, just ask about the Carmen Air. So um, you've been, do you want me to, I can list all the questions in one go, or I can feed them to you bit by bit. Um, to start off with, which grape varieties do you think work best in the concrete eggs? Or do you not do it by grape varieties? Do you look to do it by plot? Ah, for me... So what's your criteria? The, the, the concrete eggs will, will give you different, different things in the aging. So first of all, if we're talking about cepage that you will... You will uh, uh, age since the beginning, so meaning just after the fermentation, I think those cepages that more match in the concrete eggs are all those cepages that you will want to keep out from the oxidation. So just uh, thinking on Renache, for example, will help to keep that uh, reductive uh, nose. The Pinot Noir as well, because both are very sensible for the oxidation. Even in other cepages like Sanso, we make part of our Sanso in the concrete. We age since the beginning. So just to remember that the concrete, thanks to the form of the concrete, putting the, the, the wine after the fermentation inside the concrete with all the fermentation leaves with, that will keep more protected by the, the, the oxygen effect that, for example, barriques give. In the barriques, thanks to the oak staves, you know, where there are more micro-oxygenation micro effects, you know, that always will bring a little bit more air. So we have that group of fragile cepage like Renage, Sanso, or Pinot Noir. Or after another group that we work after the, the oak aging, for example, our top wine is Auma, that is a kind of, is a Bordeaux blend with, with uh, six different cepages. So all the six, uh, Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon, Carmenere, Malbec, Cabernet Franc, Merlot and Petit Verdot. So we age those cepages separately in barriques. And after two years of aging, we blend them all together in a concrete eggs and we leave the wine for an extra six or nine months in the concrete eggs. What is what interesting in a wine who been aging in, a, in barrique, for example, and we put it in the concrete eggs. It's coming with all that fine lease, I call the filet mignon of the lease. So all that fine lease coming from the bottom part of the, of the barrique put it in the concrex, will smoother, will give a, a velvety texture over the wines that will help also, you know, to develop that uh, softness in the wines. That, that for me, the, the chief effect. Fantastic. You, um, get, you, get an automatic, you get an automatic mixing, don't you? Movement of the leaves in that shape, which, which gives you more leaves effect. Exactly. It's, it's a kind of soft, soft steering that in the aging, you know, so that soft steering will keep the lease going up. So a, a, a more 
uh, uh, fermentation list in the beginning will keep from the ox uh, oxidation um, and a more fine list after uh, barrel aging will bring that softness. And in terms of oxygen, do you think barrel a uh, barrique, a 228 litre barrique will give you the most oxygen? Maybe the egg is intermediate and then the big foudre is less. How would you describe how much oxygen comes in? I, I, if I say, will depend, depend. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> so, so definitely for me, Tony, uh, barriques, first of all, yeah, to check more, more air, but in between concrete and, uh, and food dress, in the concrete eggs, we have more that stirring effect. Yeah. So if we're going with after fermentation, to a concrete X that will keep with less oxygen effect compared yeah. with a food ray. But if we're going after of a wine that is more clean, food ray and concrete X, I think will will run in the same in, in, in the same effect, you know. Yeah. So but it's a key thing how much least you work in the concrete X, you know, for that effect of protection that we want to, to avoid the oxygen. Yeah, the le just, just to say, the leaves of the dead yeast cells and other matter, and they're actually reductive. That is, they, they, actually, they actually oxygen scavenge. They eat up the oxygen. So it protects the wine from, from oxidation. So as Christabel said, if you have a lot of leaves in a concrete egg, because of the form, the leaves are put in suspension and so you get a, a real protection from oxygen and you get a sort of rich, a richness from the, from the dead yeast cells that, that gives a, a rich texture to the wine. So I don't know, I, ho I hope that's helped. There's, yeah. um, there's a couple more questions on this, which I'll try and be as brief as I can. So I'll put them all together. Um, it has been asked with the concrete eggs, is there any form of temperature control? In, in the aging? In the, yeah, while the, while the wine is in the eggs, you don't have um, the, the blankets that go on them, the, the hot water or cold water running across them. If we want to, if we want them to, to, to uh, make the fermentation, for example, we, we ferment some whites and also reds, we can add inside the concrete eggs a, a temperature egg changer, is made under a stainless steel. But if we want to age, we, we just have the concrete eggs in the barrel room where the temperature, where the, the, the room is already isolated. So the temperature of the aging will be the same that have the barrels or the food rest. Fantastic. And then the final question was, when did you start using the concrete eggs? Were you influenced by other biodynamic producers? I, I, it's a nice story that one, because in 2007, when we was just starting a, a coile with my family. I went to Bordeaux for the Vin Expo, which is a, a fair of wines that uh, is, was made uh, every, every two years in Vin Expo. And I met there uh, Messier Nomblot, Marc Nomblot, who was a, a little man from Burgundy who was made in these concrete eggs. And he created the concrete eggs in the 90s with Michel Chaputier from the Northern Rome. So it was Chaputier, who is already a biodynamic grower, who built this, uh, this concrete eggs with Marc Nomblot. Marc Nomblot was a third generation concrete tanks builder. So his family was making the concrete tanks in, uh, in, in, in all that area of Rhone and Burgundy. And with uh, Michel Chaputier, they created this in the 90s. So the deal was after, I don't know, 10, 15 years, you can buy in the market. And was in 2007, when just Magnum Bloss was talking to different growers, you know, about this concrete eggs, he told me about, he told me about it. Uh, I realized we are human, so I took three years to realize this conversation. Sometimes we're talking lo longer. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but I, I, you know, I start uh, studying the concrete eggs and I bring my first a concrete egg with another colleague from Chile in 2010. That was the first concrete egg coming in Chile 
and we bring it and we, we start doing some whites in the, at the beginning, fermentation, and after we, we start aging and all that. So 10 years ago. Amazing, amazing. Well, just looking at the time, um, I think that we have now run out of time. It's been an absolutely fascinating virtual tasting. So thank you so much to Christopher and to you, Toby, as well um, for tonight's tasting. I've learned absolutely masses, especially about concrete eggs. And um, it's just been lovely to hear you both talking, to be able to try the wines alongside you. I thought for me, the Carmen Year was one of the, the standouts this evening, because as you both said, it has that beautiful kind of, it's not overly rich, it's not green, it's kind of that perfect kind of Goldilocks right, um, right in the perfect point. Um, for those of you who have not had enough of Toby this week, he, you're back with us again on Wednesday, aren't you, Toby? Um, with Idina and Huber from, um, from Bodega Spinet. But um, as for this evening, Christabel, thank you ever so much for giving us your time and um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Toby, would you like to add anything? Not really, just, just to thank you, Christabel. I, I always learn so much. Um, uh, when I hear you talk, and I think um, I think seeing the different terraces, I think was was very good. You get an idea of um, how carefully you looked at the vigor of the soil and planted higher, lower density where there's more vigor at the bottom, which produces much more grapes per plant. Um, so the vine is balanced, but its natural potential is to make good rather than grape wines. And then as you go up. The, the smaller yields per plant. Um, uh, it's just a great demonstration of, of, of terroir. And, um, you know, I love what you're doing and I, I think you're making great wines and um, may that continue for a long time. Thank you so much, Christabel. Well, th thank you, Emma, Toby, and the whole, the Wine Society team and group, you know, I'm, I'm very, I feel very proud, you know, to work with the Wine Society I'm very proud to, to share every year with Toby when he came to our vineyard, you know, and he always gave me an idea to do. And uh, been a long, long uh, process of learning. And of course, as Toby say, you know, this year been a very difficult year, a very challenging year, yeah, where we've been learning how, how to, uh, how to live with this pandemia times, you know, from the from the harvest here, we just start with this pandemic uh, problem in March, as well you, you know, and was on, at the time that we was starting our harvest. So this been a very holistic cycle, you know, from the harvest time in March and after all the vinification of the wines, when the pandemic problems went going up and the lockdowns w was increasing, and after that, uh, see all of our clients uh, locked down as well, you know, all the on trade in Chile, many of our clients out, uh, out in, uh, in other regions, you know, uh, countries. But uh, being a, a, a nice process as every process. I, I, the other day I, I was talking with a client and I, I can compare this when the time that I learned to make biodynamic wines oh, and to, to learn uh, about how biodynamic management in the vineyard was. So it took, took us a couple of years. I hope this will not took us as much longer. I think it, that in that way will be uh, more uh, quick uh, learning, but uh, it's a learning process and it's, uh, it's lovely to be with you guys today here and to be able to, to share our vision and these wines. Thank you, thanks. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Emma. Cheers. Cheers, Toby. And cheers. Salud a todo, uh, all the team. Uh. <laughs> Thank you.